show is sponsored by Hive Mind CRM. It is more than just a CRM. It is a real estate and business mastermind that comes with an all-in-one CRM. You can have unlimited websites and users. You can call, text, RVM, and email all in one user interface. And you can set up custom automations for any type and multiple businesses. 65% of companies start using a CRM system within the first five years of business. Once implemented, the hive mind will save you on marketing, give you more time, and make more money. One of our users has had his first $100,000 month using our system in June. We want to see you automate and accelerate your business. Text us at 210-972-1842 for future meetings. And of course, to get our $1 course on how to make more than six figures on one land deal. You can schedule your free demo today at hivemindcrm.io. All right, what up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Daniel Martinez, who is the co-founder of Hive Mind CRM and host of the Hive With Us podcast. Daniel, how you doing? I'm good, man. Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. And we'd like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, my name is Daniel Martinez. I am an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur for four years. I originally am a, used to load trucks, became a truck driver, started my own trucking company. So I've, I've operated a truck company for two years, drove for four years. A lot of people like that story because I'm a blue collar person who became an entrepreneur. And then I pivoted into real estate and software. I own a data company, software company, I operate and do real estate. And what I do for fun is podcasting. I really enjoyed the conversation of it and just kind of building your own brand from scratch and the power of that and having meaningful conversations with speakers or guests. So that's kind of what I do for fun now. I like the embodiment and conversation because you can have a really good conversation with other entrepreneurs, but usually it's never recorded. And I think that's the really power of podcasts is you can have really meaningful conversations where essentially you're a fly on the wall and you can hear and learn from different, different, different investors, speakers in general. So it's pretty cool. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I love it. I actually started the podcast because I wasn't having enough of those meaningful conversations in day-to-day life. You know, a lot of people just love small talk and, you know, I think it has its place, honestly, not with conversations that I like to have with people, but a lot of people love small talk. And every time I would ask somebody about dreams and goals or something serious in their life, just at like a church function, they would just kind of shy away and it just grinded my gears. So that's a big reason why I started the podcast to have those meaningful conversations and let other people in on them. Well, cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Tell us a little bit about starting that trucking company. So you were loading trucks and you went to starting a trucking company. That's a big leap. Tell us about what made you made the decision and kind of the adversity you met. met So one thing I I love, I love saying this, but um, if you are in the town you grew up with, the biggest growth and learning experience you can do is leave home. Mm. Even if you leave an hour away, just leave the comfort of your home because you'll find new friends. You'll find a new circle. You'll find a new hustle. You'll find something. So I'm 30 now. I started loading. My first job was loading. I used to just sit door to door sales kind of a year after that. It was like a part-time job. Started loading trucks. When I started loading trucks, it was more of like, and I had no, no idea where I was going. I'm just like, I know I need money to pay bills. Let me just do something. So started forklifting, ended up, I was in Chicago at the time and I never wanted to drive trucks just because I hate snow driving in the snow. I'm like, I'll drive to work, but I'm, there's no way I'm putting more weight and more length behind me. And then driving that in the snow, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. So I had the opportunity to leave to go to Atlanta when I was 24, 23 ish. I was probably 22 actually. So I moved to Atlanta. When I got to Atlanta, I, was, I worked for the same company loading trucks. And when I got down there, I'm like, there's no snow down here. Like, there, I can make more money driving trucks. Let's try it. See what happens. So I got my license through the company. They trained me how to drive, drive with them, uh, drive the trucks through their in-house training. Did that for two years. And when I was transitioning to entrepreneurship, everybody's like, when do you, everybody, so there's a question everybody always asks, when is the right time to become an entrepreneur? And like, there is no right time. You just have to do it. You just have to jump right into it for fee first and, fail forward and crash and burn some few times and then figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife was pregnant, I found out my wife was pregnant and I'm like, okay, if I don't do it now, I will never do this in my life because now I have responsibilities. Let me just go for this now. So 
when my wife, when my wife was pregnant, I worked my butt off. I was working like six days a week, 70 hours a week. Every extra job I could take, I was taking it, just working, working, working. When she was about to have a baby, took my two-week vacation, paternity leave, all the holidays, took a three-month paternity leave and quit and haven't worked for anybody else ever since. And my daughter's about to turn five this year. So it's been a crazy, interesting journey. Not easy. I wouldn't recommend it to do what I did, but there's a Steve Harvey quotes that uh, sometimes you have to jump off a cliff with no parachute and a parachute appears. That's kind of how entrepreneurship is. So there's no right time to do it. And sometimes it's just failing forward and figuring out as you go and you kind of stuff happens, miracles happen in your, in your path. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love that. So you're telling me you were working full time. And when you found out your wife got pregnant, you did you ramp up your full time hours or did you keep your 40 hours and you start working 30 hours a week on the business? No, I didn't. I would, I was working. I mean, I only knew at that time, I only knew how to make money through the job. So I just worked every hour I could. I'd pick up extra shifts, work my work on my days off. I would, at the end of the day, I'm like, hey, can I do anything else to make up, make an extra hour? So I was literally working nonstop for nine months. It was crazy. And because I knew I was taking that time off towards the end. So I'm like, there's something. That was a drive. That was the end goal in mind when I was doing that. So I just worked my butt off for those nine months, and it was crazy. <laughs> and so then, when your wife had the kid, you took the maternity leave and you had some vacation time and stuff. And then after that, you were done. You were already making enough money from the business to not go back, or did you just leap? I just left, man. I left. I had saved some money working all those extra hours. I had I had a cushion built up. I the four hundred one k I had from the job, I cashed that in. So I had like a little lump sum to start the business. The crazy thing is, is I did the business for two years. If you're an entrepreneur, one thing I say this all the time too, is that you don't have to make as much money as you do as an entrepreneur than you do as an employee. Yeah. So I didn't know that. It was one of those things I didn't know. So even me having my own business, I wasn't really making that much money, but I didn't need to make as much because I wasn't paying taxes. So my first two years as an entrepreneur actually got tax returns and never paid a dime in taxes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That is amazing. Wait, tell but us about I mean, that. Cause I don't think, I don't even know about that. I didn't know that was a thing. So tell us how that works. So if you make under like, if you make under 40 grand a year as a self-employed uh, person, you don't have to pay any taxes on that. They actually, the government will actually give you money to stay self-employed. So like the, there's uh, now that I'm in real estate, I hear of like these like multifamily investors, they have so much debt and depreciation that they still get tax returns. Mm, yep. So it's one of those things where like either you have to either you don't make enough money or don't make enough money on paper that you still get tax returns, the stimulus checks, you get all that stuff if you are a legit investor or or, or if you're not making that much money as an entrepreneur. So it's just one of those things that I didn't know. I set my taxes in like, oh, you, you're getting like seven grand. I'm like, I didn't even pay any taxes. I'm still getting seven grand. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just one of those things you don't know till you, you go down that path. And I don't know, you don't need to make as much money. Cause like my last year of working a job, I made a hundred grand and I was way more comfortable making like 40 as an entrepreneur of take home. You know, yep. it's just one of those things. And you can, do, you can, you can pay expenses business expenses. Yeah. So it's one of those things where like, I only made $30,000. Don't tax me. And then they still give me a tax return and you can do whatever you want. But that's one of those, it was one of those things like you don't know that till you go down that path unless, unless you're hearing it today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. There we go. So jumped in with the trucking business and how long until it got to the point where you were feeling comfortable enough to start branching out to other stuff? Cause now you're in real estate, you own some other businesses. Did you acquire those? Did you start those? Tell us a bit about and I've been start, I've been starting everything. There's a there's a certain enjoyment you get from starting businesses, and I just started those. But trucking, the reason why I got a trucking is because I wasn't making enough money, and I I was pivoting. I had to pivot. So, and while my two years of trucking, I generated five hundred and fifty thousand dollars in revenue. I didn't make very much money, and it wasn't really worth my time. I ended up getting like five trucks. It was just a lot of expenses, and this is where it comes down where you don't know what you don't know. So my first business where I kind of fumbled the ball was, is that it wasn't very profitable. It's not a very profitable business to be in. And a lot of people are like, oh, I make tons of money in trucking. I'm like, you probably spend tons of money in trucking. Yeah. <laughs> even when you make it. So for everyone who doesn't know about business, you have a, you have a profit margin. So for every hundred dollars you make, most businesses spend about 50 to 80% of that. And 20% is that profit, 20 to 50% is profit. In trucking, 
it's like 90%. Oh, wow. It's just publicly traded companies like FedEx, SIA, Old Dominion, UPS, they operate on a margin of usually 3% or less profitability. And they're publicly traded billion dollar companies that operate off of 3% or less profit margin. That is insane. It's insane. It's literally insane. You can go look it up, fact check me. But, and you as a small business and a tr- small business trucking company, you're operating at like 10% on paper. But when stuff goes wrong, you got to come with that out of pocket and consider your profit margin. So you're not really, if I made 550, technically on paper, I only made 55,000 in two years, but stuff goes wrong. Yeah. And you're, eating, you're eating that all that cost. So it's just one of those things where, Whatever business you do go into, make sure you understand the numbers and everything that comes with it because you're going to, you even us, as we we're talking about lists before this call, we're, we're both in real estate. You got to pay marketing. You got to pay software costs. You got to pay the dialer. You got to pay direct mail. You got to pay PPC. You're paying some type of marketing expense for those real estate deals that bring in ten to $20,000 a deal. You're going to pay for that in some way to acquire those deals. So it's just one of the understand, understanding, understanding the business that sometimes time, money, knowledge, it's going to take a lot of one of those, one of those things to get a deal in real estate and in business and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I love it, man. Well, thanks for giving us that little business lesson right there. That was like a whole course in an MBA program. <laughs> and I went to college for two years and I felt like it was a waste of time just because I didn't learn anything. But if you want to learn business, you gotta learn through the school of make it failing forward, losing yeah. money, making stupid decisions. And you, you'll, you'll feel, you'll feel, you'll feel and learn the lessons a lot faster. Exactly. <laughs> you exactly. won't waste time uh, going to school for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, awesome, man. Tell us a little bit about your motivation. What gets you up and keeps you going every day? So motivation, it, it was never about the money. It was more of impact and freedom are my two big motivations. And that's why I kind of do podcasting for fun. It's more making an impact side of it. The job side of it, not so the job, but the, the business side of it is the freedom side of it that it gives you. So the reason why I work, I wanted to start this entrepreneurship journey when my wife was pregnant is because my dad, no respect to my dad, but my dad worked all the time. Like he would commute three to four hours just to get to work and then work eight, nine hours and then drive back. So it was one of those things where like he was always gone, come home, eat dinner, literally watch the news and then go to bed. So like my, my relationship with my, my father was literally, was very minimal just because he was a provider, which wasn't a bad thing, but there's a balance that you learn when you become a parent yourself and when you want to become a parent. And for me, I wanted to spend time with my kids. So a lot of the reasons why I became an entrepreneurship when I went into entrepreneurship was to spend more time with my kids. So now that all my kids, I have three kids now, I was there when they were born. I've helped my wife through that first month of craziness when you have, have you, have you have a kid yourself? I don't know. I'm 23. For anybody that has a kid and when you have your first kid, the first month after your spouse has a child is literally nuts because they have to be fed every two to three hours. And if you put that burden on your significant other to take care of that, they will literally lose their mind. Not kidding you. Yeah. Because of lack of sleep, there's a toll on their body. They already had it went through giving birth and they're just, it's just a lot of mental stability that they go through. So with all my kids, I was there to help my wife throughout the thing. I took, uh, I took night shift to my wife would sleep six, six to eight hours a night. And I would take over at the night and watch my kids and just hold them and do all that stuff, do all the fatherly things I wanted to do because I had the freedom to. And it was just enjoying those, those memories. Like I've seen my kids grow up from day one to there right now. And I've been there the whole time going on trips. Like my family, I just came from vacation for two weeks to so like, Oh, we're going, we were going to this place and this place for two weeks. All right, I'll see you there. I got to make sure my boss lets me off, but I'll be there. It's just one of those things where like, I can afford to do whatever I want. You have the freedom to, and it's not that I don't work and I don't work hard. It's just that I have the freedom and flexibility to, to work when I want and where I want to, and I can do it from anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I would love to hear a little bit. This is something I've been curious about. You know, I see Gary V and Alex Formosi. They're all on social media and they're talking about how they just grind for 16 hours a day. And something I've realized, like I've been doing the podcast, I've been doing, I have similar goals, right? Of I started entrepreneurship to have the free time to spend with my kids when I start to have them. 
And so I'm curious as to what a day in the life of you as an entrepreneur looks like, because sometimes I'll automate stuff. Like I've automated the podcast. I post a daily podcast. I guess I, I think I put seven hours a week into this and I post daily. Right. And so I've created systems and processes to automate. And then I find myself in the middle of the day, I'm just like, well, I've kind of done everything there is to do. And so I want to hear you speak to that part of it a little bit. So it's, it's balance. So when you first start entrepreneurship, you always, you're always working harder than you should. And if you, it depends on what type of, how big of an entrepreneur you want to get to. So there's Harmozy and all these other entrepreneurs at Gary Vee. They are like almost like workaholics, but they're workaholics towards their own ambition and dreams. Mm-hmm. So they can kind of, us as entrepreneurs, you can kind of get stuck in that cog where you're still working too much. And I struggled with that a little bit early on, but I'm kind of pivoting my focus now because I'm realizing what's really important. So I still struggle with this sometimes where like my day starts at like 10 a.m. I, I, I sleep in, I sleep in every day. Like it's one of those things where like I am not a morning person and I'm not aspiring to be like the 4 a.m. work week, whatever, whatever. Those things, people like wake up at 4 a.m. If you don't wake up at 4 a.m., you're not a boss. I'm like, I still make money and I don't wake up at 4 a.m. I'm sorry to bring it to you. <laughs> but it's one of those things where like you have to find your peace and your balance. Like when you work in a job, you really don't have a choice. Like I work midnights. I would start work at 11 a.m., 11, no, 11.30 p.m. Like you don't have a choice. You go to bed at 4, 4 p.m., wake up at 11, you go to work. <laughs> but yeah. when you are an entrepreneurship, you kind of have to measure that. So like me, I'm like, I'm not waking up early. I'm just not going to do it. I, I don't have no ambition to wake up early. So I wake up late, start work around 10 o'clock at meetings. My schedule fills up usually two weeks in advance. I already know what I'm doing for that day. And I have flexibility. My wife's like, hey, I want to do this two weeks out. I'm like, all right, let me block off the day and we'll go do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it's one of those things where like, you have to make time for yourself too. So one thing that I've done, I was, I realized I was working too much. And I, as an entrepreneur, you work every day. I work every day, no matter what, but I kind of clear off my calendar Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. I still might work those days, but I don't have anything that's on the calendar. So if anything important doesn't come up, I just have the day off. So Right now, what I'm doing, I try and go golfing twice a, twice a month. I've been try, I, I want to take care of my health a lot more, so I'm trying to focus on getting the gym. I might get a trainer. You focus on really you, your family activities, just just doing stuff around the house. I don't know, go to the park, go to the beach, all that normal stuff. But like I said, it's not that I don't work. I just work. I choose when I want to work. So I usually work maybe four to, three to four hours in the afternoon. Evening, I'll maybe work two hours, and that's about it. That's about all my day, <laughs> dude. I, I after, love the computer, after the kids go to sleep, I work two hours on the computer. After everything's done, my wife's already getting ready for bed, and I'll stay up late and work on the computer because that's like, like there's no kids crying, there's no kids walking in the office, there's nothing like that. <laughs> Dude, I I love that so much, especially with you know hustle culture, and I love how the first thing that you dispelled was you got to wake up at four a.m. because <laughs> it's just so nice to see an entrepreneur who's successful, who knows himself, knows where his pocket of success is. And he's like, I'm okay with that. And that's where you're at. So I appreciate that. It's a big myth. And like ever, like people put so much pressure on yourselves. And I think entrepreneurs do it the, the worst because they feel like they, in order to be successful or in order to make a big business or profitable business, you have to do these things that other people do. And I'm like, really, you kind of set your own boundaries and find out what, where you can accelerate your time. So uh, one thing that I will say is uh, revenue generated activities, RGA, revenue generated activities. Like me, my kids, and like right now, I'm doing this podcast. You know why? Because my kids are napping. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I picked this time. It's it's an opportunity to do a record. When I'm in my peak podcasting thing, I do like two to three recordings a day. Like it's crazy. Yeah. And like yeah. I said a lot of my passion goes towards podcasting side because it's more of making an impact on that side. One of my things is that my kids know that I'm recording right now. They're, they're five and under. So sometimes they know when I'm recording. And the reason why I do this is because I'll leave out such a big digital footprint that they can see. When I was five years old, this is what my dad was doing. And this is, this is him in this conversation. And I can see who he was and why he was important. I love but, that. And like I so said, you don't, you don't know how much time you have here as well. Like this may be my last recording I ever record. Who knows? But it's one of those things like every, everything you impact and put out into the world, you don't know the, how, how long it's going to last. And 
no one really knows the true impact they make because usually it lives past them if they're trying to make an impact. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I love it. Well, cool, man. Let's go ahead and jump into your dreams and goals now. What is your vision for your businesses, your entrepreneurial career, and your life? Goals. I would like to travel more. And this is one of the things I'm, I'm doing now as I've kind of matured in my entrepreneurship journey. And like now the funds are av- make it becoming more available too. And it's just one of those things where like, I want to travel, probably live abroad. I don't think I want to live in the US very much longer. I want my kids to experience a different cult, different cultures and know that the American way isn't always the best. Not to bash America. I grew up here and I love America, but it's, it's crazy these days. <laughs> It is, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy these days and not in a good way. As far as ambitions and goals, I really didn't know what that was. Like for me personally, it's just always been the freedom. The freedom's freedom and making an impact and making sure my family's taken care of has always been my personal goal. My business goal was helping other businesses succeed. Like I didn't know that was my goal till I had one of my clients have six figure a month. And I'm like, what the heck? Like I have a client that made a hundred grand in a month, like that's $1.2 million a year if he does that consistently. So now my thing is like, let's have as many people have six figure months. So we started our software, which is a business automation software, uh, February, 2021. So it's about 15 months now that we've launched that we've already had 10 clients have over six figure months. And, uh, we just, did, I did an interview today with one of my clients. He did 200 grand in revenue off of my software. So now we're having like, we're making hundred thousand dollar months. We're making millionaires. We're making a lot of impact in a lot of people's lives because now for me, it's just like, I have a, I have a product and a service that helps people make more money to take care of their families and their families and their families. And everybody that makes hundred K a month, they don't do it by themselves. They have employees. Now we're impacting people's lives and families that people I've never meet. I'll never meet. I'm impacting. Yeah. That is absolutely amazing. I love that. I love the I also love the practical focus on the impact side of things. Like I think a lot of times we can get to impacting people and I'm guilty of this myself. Like one of my biggest goals is to like raise the standard of living across the world to like the point where it's middle-class America and nobody's really worried about food, shelter, water, stuff like that. But when I get to thinking about how that's actually done, (laughs) there's a lot that goes into it and not all of it's very practical, which yeah, dream big, go for it. But you also have to bring it down to a practical level of like, I have a service that not only adds value to me, but it also adds value to people and adds value to a third party being their employees or the people that they're doing business with. So I like the practicality of helping other businesses succeed that way. I think it's cool. And like I said, you don't know the reach that you have. You really don't. And you really don't know the impact that it can make and how big of an impact it makes in general. It's just one of those things where like, I know I'm doing a good thing, so I'm just going to do more of it. Yep. I don't know. There That's we it. go. <laughs> there we go. And it's like when you help good people, it's like they turn around and help more people and help more people. And the ripple effect, man, like you said, you just don't know. It's so awesome. So one, of, one of my quotes that I like is I, I help people that help people. Mm. Yeah. No, that's a good one. I like that. I like that a lot. I help people that help people. <laughs> Do you ever hear stories about like what they, what they turned around and did after? So $200,000 in a month, obviously, maybe that changed their life. Maybe they were doing that before. But do you ever hear stories about kind of the impact that they go to make afterwards? I really don't hear the impact afterwards. I mean, you hear people like, I bought, I bought a car, or I'm buying my own property now. And it's just one of those things like, you don't, you don't, and it's, one, it's not like it's a bad thing, but when you help a lot of people, you don't necessarily hear it all. Exactly. All the time, and you don't hear the impact that it does make. And it's not like I'm taking credit for everything that they did either. It's one of those things where like, if I've, I don't know how much impact I did to pr- provide that result. So I'm not going to take credit for it, but I see that there's something changed mm-hmm. and internally that little, even if it was just one poke or one conversation. And this is something I, I do internally too, is that, you don't know the impact you make with regular individuals. So whenever I have convers- meeting call conversations, if I'm at the airport, if I'm at a restaurant, I try and poke some type of goodness or happiness upon them because you don't know the ripple it can, uh, it can create down the line. Absolutely. I love it. Well, awesome. We got travel more, freedom, making an impact, making sure your family's taken care of and helping other businesses succeed. Are there any other dreams or goals that you want to chat about? Man, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> 
it's there. I don't know. I don't know what the, I didn't expect to be in real estate. I didn't expect to be in software four years ago. I didn't expect yeah. to be doing it. It's just one of those things where like stuff is presented to you and everybody asks, how'd you get into real estate? I, like, I fell into it. How'd you get into software? Like, I fell into it. Like, yeah. I don't know. I'm going to do it next year. I'm just, I'm going down this path and stuff is being presented, opportunities being presented in front of me. And I just, I just take advantage of it. So one thing that people struggle with, and if you're aspiring to be an entrepreneur is that the job takes your most, your best hours and your, your best time on purpose, because it keeps that vision and cloudiness over your eyes that you can't see opportunity. Once you have the ability to see opportunity, you see it all around you. Yep. Yeah. I love that. Especially with these remote jobs nowadays, I feel like a lot of opportunity comes from relationships. And when it's all remote, you're not in other business places. Like you're only talking to people on Zoom or whatever it may be. It's even harder to see that opportunity. So I agree. That's a good point. I've never thought about that. And it'll definitely be something I like to motivate people a lot and get them rah, rah to kind of make that choice. It'll be something I bring up from now on. (laughs) There we go, man. Well, if there were one or two people that you can meet right now, and this could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take the next step towards your dreams and goals, who would they be and how would they do it? I don't know, man. That was a hard, that was a hard question because I like the experience excuse me, I like the experience that other people have, but when it comes down to it, they're just human. And a lot of times when you meet your, your idols or people you want to be, they're not really, they don't really, they don't actually fit the mold that you had in your head because in their head, they think they're God, like Jeff Bezos, richest man, Elon Musk, richest man. They're just, man, they still put on the same pants. I do the same way I do. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they might, they might have exponential, not more knowledge than I do, but they're still human. They still make mistakes. They still do things. So it's not necessarily that I would like to, I, I like, I like extracting knowledge. So me and my partner, we talk, we talk about like, um, like sci, not science, but sci-fi stuff is that the, the way to acquire wealth faster. And this is what Elon and Jeff Bezos has done is they found a way to acquire knowledge faster. And if you find a way to acquire knowledge faster, you can accelerate the, the time and money that comes to you. So we talk about this as like, if you ever, if you've ever seen like, if you made $5,000 a day since Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was born, you would still be $50 billion cheap, 50 to $50 billion poorer than, than Jeff Bezos. And it's one of those things where like, they found a way to capture time because like one of the, one of the things you always capitalize, like. $50,000 a year might've been a lot of money before COVID. If you do that for 20 years, it's a million dollars, right? A million dollars. If you find a way to acquire a million dollars a year, well, now you just collapse time as far as a 20 year span that a normal person makes to create a million dollars. You've then collapsed it in 5% of the time in, in, 20, in one year. So it's one of those ways that when you learn to acquire money, you can collapse time and, and make more money with the knowledge, you know, mm, I love that. Oh, I kind of want to, I want a, um, the title of the podcast to be something around that idea. <laughs> I'm still thinking it through because I can't formulate the words, but it'll probably be something around the collapsing time to, or making money to collapse time or whatever, something around that. You got any ideas? To make more money, you have to collapse time. I don't know. To make more money, you have to collapse time with Daniel Martinez. That's going to be the title. And it's one of those things where like, you don't know that, but if you find a way, like, People that make a million dollars a year, everything. Oh, they're evil. The root of all e- the root of all evil is money. I'm like, it's not really money. It's it's that they found a way to capture time, mm-hmm. and they ca- to capture physical time. Like everybody, like oh, entrepreneurs, they do all this stuff, and they're they're always evil and stuff like that. But like, if you work at McDonald's and you go buy lunch, that's thirty dollars. You just ate three hours of your time because that's your wage per hour because you work maybe. Eight dollars an hour, and that's what you did. You ate three hours, three, three hours of your time right there. So you have to make your time more profitable, doing revenue generating activities, and understanding that not everybody is worth your time, and understanding where your time is best utilized. For those listening, we you've said revenue generating activities a couple times now. Can you talk to us about how to identify and prioritize the revenue generating activities for our specific life or our business? 
I know it's probably unique for each person, but it hundred percent is. So a lot of entrepreneurs, they struggle with holding the reins. Like there's controlling people that they, they want control of the admin stuff. They want this. They're the best salesman that they can ever be. They're the, they're the best admin cold caller. You might be the best texter out there or whatever that is, whatever it is in your business. If it's outsourceable for 50 bucks or less an hour, you probably best to outsource it. And there's people, people are giving gifts. Everybody has a gift, no matter what it is. It might be the best cold caller, best negotiator, the best CEO. Y'all have a gift. You should not be exercising stuff that's not your gift. When uh, this is, there's a book called Who Not How. I have not read it, but I, I've heard enough about it that I practice it. Like a couple of years ago, I stopped cutting my grass. Some people might think it's lazy of me to not cut my grass, but it's just like, I can do better things than cut my grass for an hour or two. And there's a professional out there that does a nicer job than I will. And they have the proper equipment and they can make it look nice the way my wife likes it. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it better than they will. So I'm just going to hire them to do it. So there's somebody out there that wherever your pain point is, they excel at that spot. If you're, if they're good at creating websites and you're trying to create your website, stop trying to create a website, you're better things to do than start trying to create a website. Everybody wants to put their hands in the pot to make sure, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. When you become an entrepreneur, you have to, hey, do this, do this. You have to delegate. There's a quote by uh, Rockefeller that says that I would rather have 1% of 100 people's effort than 100% of mine. Mm. Yeah. And that's just letting go of and delegating. Like, I know I could, I could do things better than my team in some, some ways, but I let them do it and I exercise them the ability and freedom to do it on their own because I want them to excel at it themselves. And even to the point where some people on my team have now accelerated past my knowledge and now they fit that space ever than I could because yeah. I'm the CEO. So I kind of let that, I let that position go. I let it go in my mind. And that's the hardest part. You gotta let it go here. You gotta let that let go of the control. And you let it go, the, let go of the control and let your team fill in the gaps, partners, let them fill in the gaps. And that's where it's important to find the right team members and right partners in your business in general. And don't do it by yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you mentioned who, not how, because whether you had or not, I was going to mention it right after I have read the book. I can vouch for Daniel in saying that he explained the concept perfectly. Find your genius zone and kind of stick to it. And other people have their genius zones. And if you're not a sales guy, hire a sales guy or partner with a sales guy. My next question to you is for those solopreneurs right now that lack the funds to hire, how would you suggest they utilize who not how in their life? So I'm a bad example of this because I've had like really bad employees and I'm like, I was really turned off by hiring employees, but I've gotten better with this. And I asked the podcast guest this question who has tons of employees. And his idea was that a lot of people, they, they formulate like I have, to, if you're paying this person 60,000 a year, I have to have $5,000 a month of cash flow to pay this person to have this person in my business. The answer is, is that you only need them really for three months, because after three months, they should be producing more than what you pay them on top of, they should increase your your output versus take away from your output. So as long as you have some cash reserves, a way to pay them for those three months, you can hire as much as you want. I gotcha. I gotcha. And would you suggest that people get access to business lines of credit to pay for people? Or would you suggest it's like, nope, as a solopreneur, get the cash flow first, make some sales, handle some marketing, and then start hiring it out once your cash flow positive. So my answer is not going to be similar to others because this is, I, I went into debt to start my first business and I'm still dealing with the ramifications of that. And a lot of people, I'm working to pay it off right now, but it's one of those things where like people fall into depressions because of debt. People go down bad paths because of that alcoholism, drugs, all that stuff because of debt. Debt is fake. Just like the money you take from customers is fake. So when it comes down to it, I learned a lot about debt and debt is just when I learned a lot about debt from real estate and I learned a lot about debt from other things. So if anybody who has a lot of credit card debt, just let it, let it sit there for a little bit and the credit card company will send you a letter to discount it. (laughs) 
in re- real talk. Yeah, they will. <laughs> they they really will. They'll they're like if you have two thousand dollars worth of debt, they will send you a discard. They will send you a letter saying, "Hey, would you settle for thirteen hundred and fifty dollars if you settle this two thousand dollar debt?" If they sell it to a, another creditor, let's say you have five thousand dollars worth of debt, they probably sold it to another credit card buyer debt collector for fifteen hundred bucks. So anything they make over fifteen hundred bucks is profit. So they sold that debt penny in the pennies in the dollar. It's a federally insured. There's a quote I like is, is I'd rather go into credit card debt than ruin my credibility with others. Mm. Because credit card debt is can be forgiven, it's insured, it's all that stuff. I'd rather go into credit card debt than to take money from fellow family members or friends and not pay it back because that's that's bad. So it's one of those things where like you you if you understand the debt laws. I had talked to a guy about podcasting and he, he actually buys notes and he buys debts and judgments. And like, technically you can create an LLC that buys debt and have your friend call them and say, yeah, we buy credit card debt. At least you know you have debt with so-and-so we want to buy it. <laughs> you can buy, if you can have somebody else buy your debt from the creditor, pays in the dollar and then just forgive it yourself. There's a video. Have you ever heard of John Oliver on HBO? I've not, no. <laughs> oh, for everybody listening to this, John Oliver, HBO, he's a com- comedy, comedy, he has a comedy show on HBO. He did a segment on debt. You can go John Oliver debt, you'll find it. It's probably millions of views on it. What he did was, is he found, I was like, I don't know if it was like $1 million or a billion dollars. It might have, it might have been like $5 million, $10 million worth of debt. I don't know the exact number. It was over a million dollars of debt. He bought it all pennies on the dollar and then forgave it all and sent them all a letter. And that was, that was part of his segment that he, he's like, oh, hey, so-and-so, you had $10,000 worth of debt. We just forgave your debt. And it was just one of the things that he, he bought it for probably 100 bucks, and But it was, it was like millions of dollars worth of debt. He bought it all cash and then just forgave it all. That is amazing. But it's one of those things where like, like debt doesn't, like when you understand, when you leverage real estate and debt, it's just, it, it becomes. Almost, Bro, you, you realize money is fake. <laughs> it becomes it comes almost comical. Yeah. It becomes almost comical. So like when I was going through the transition of my business, my brother's like, hey, we got debt collectors calling us about your debt. I'm like, dude, I'm probably fine. Dude. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and they're, they're stressing out over my debt that I had. And I'm like, dude, don't worry about it. It's fake, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got you. That's- it's, one, it's one of those things where like, it, even in real estate, like, the reason why we like, and for everyone to know, we do, we do land real estate. The reason why we like land real estate is because we can create notes out of nothing. So let's say you have a, a $20,000 lot. You can go sell it cash for $20,000. But if you sell that thing on our finance, you could probably sell it for 40. Yep. As long as they can afford the payments, they'll make the payments. They don't even know. They don't care what the ARV is. <laughs> yeah, it's facts. So you, you create money out of nothing. And that's what debt and owner financing and all that stuff. It's all in that same realm and same space. And you can sell that note to a note buyer who gets a certain interest rate and they'll buy it based off of whatever your terms are. So there's a lot of things that come into debt, debt turn, buying notes, all that stuff kind of correlates. So I'm like, I'm in that space. I'm just like, uh, I'm not really afraid of debt. It's just one of those things. (laughs) I feel that. I feel that. (laughs) That's good. I'm gonna have to have my uh, fiance listen to this. Awesome. Well, now we're going to jump into our thriving three. And the first question is, what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. Oh, I'm okay. So I'm not a reader at all. I, I'm like, you got to be a, a re, CEOs, read 50 books to be mm-hmm. successful. I'm not a reader. <laughs> <It's> not. <laughs> I'm, breaking, I'm breaking all the tropes here. I'm sorry. But I, the last book I read was... Moses Brook, hundred million million dollar offers, and it's one of my struggling points. I do need to read more, one hundred percent. I do need to read more, and I'm trying to do better, but I struggle with it. Do you know uh, Charles Oglesby? I do not. I, f- I feel like I've heard the name, but I don't. He the, the book before that, the last one I read. So his book is uh, "Make a Million While You're Young." It's a little little book. It's, you can get it for a dollar. <laughs> it's a, it, was a good, it was a good little book that he did. I think it's ten dollars now, actually. But my favorite entrepreneur movie is the founder the founder is is such a great movie and, oh and uh social network 
those are such great movies. And if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, you're, you're, you're going to learn insights of it. Even The Banker. The Banker's a good one, too. Gotcha. With Samuel Jackson. I haven't seen any of those three, so I'll have to go watch all of them. The bank, the Banker, Social Network, and The Founder are my favorite like entrepreneur movies. They're great. The Banker's about... He, he's a wholesaler. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's Sam, awesome. Samuel Jackson's one of the main characters. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I'll have to go watch that. I think it's Samuel Jackson. I, f- I forget. But yeah, the banker, the banker's a good one. The founder, the founder's about McDonald's and social networks about Facebook. But those are all really good entrepreneur movies. But yeah, I'm not a book reader though. <laughs> there we go. There we go. You know, I had the world's fastest reader on the podcast. And he talks about how if, if you want to read more books, maybe you learn how to do this skill so you can start reading books in a minute. I kid you not. This man literally said, The only reason I can't read books faster is because it takes time to turn the page. Like he literally turns the page, reads it in like half a second because he activates the part of his brain that is like watching a movie. And, you know, some would call it like a photo. What's that? Photographic memory. Photographic memory. But he thought it was that. And then he went and taught kids how to read this way. And they like read through a college textbook and aced the exam as middle schoolers in like a week. So if you are serious about wanting to read more, but you don't want to like take the time to read because it's boring because it, it, it can be boring sometimes, maybe check out his website because um, he teaches people how to read faster. Might be I, a thought. I might be dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Also, man, it's like, I get that people say reading is good and knowledge is good, but if you can get it from like podcasts or YouTube videos or movies or audiobooks it's just as fine you know so one thing one thing i did and it's probably the the speed reader guy would probably give me better tips because that's what I, but for me that struggles with reading what i did was i downloaded the audiobook and i downloaded the regular book and i kind of followed along in both ways mm. that's how yeah. i did it. but i struggle i struggle with reading <laughs> i know i feel that I, I struggle with consistently reading all get really intense into a book and I'll read it in like two days, but then I won't read another book for like two, three, four, five, six weeks. And I'll like be trying, I'll read a couple pages. I'll be like, ah, this just ain't it. I feel like I, when I need knowledge, I like go seek it, but I'm not good at consistently seeking it. And the problem with that is you don't know what you need all the time. (laughs) So if you're consistently seeking, you might find something that sparks a light bulb. I have, I have a hack for this for people like me, for people like me. So I'm part of a mastermind and they kind of go over like, it's like a book club type thing every once in a while mm-hmm. and they go over books. So I'll get the general synopsis of the book without ever reading it because they'll break it down for me. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. I, I enjoy those calls because I'm like, I don't know, like, oh, I read the 80 pages of the book and I'm like, all right, what's the, what's, what's the meat of the bones? Spit it at me. <laughs> As it can typically be summed up in about five to six sentences. So, That's it. Literally. See, I've already read Who Not How, and I haven't even read it yet. Literally, yeah, you have. <laughs> well, cool, man. What's one way you like to take care of yourself? I sleep. <laughs> Love it. A, a lot of people struggle with not sleeping enough, and I told my wife, and God bless her heart, she takes care of the kids in the morning because I'm like, I cannot do it. Like, I start losing my mind if, I'm not, if I don't get enough sleep. And like my brothers are making fun of me because I just came back from vacation and like I was the last one awake every morning and they're laughing at me. I'm like, bro, I was still working on vacation. You just didn't see me, but I'm sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Dude, sleep is important. It's literally a superpower. One, you'll live longer. Two, you're healthier. And three, you function more efficiently, which is probably why you can get away with three to four hours of work in the afternoon because you can focus better. And a lot of people can focus. So I, I, told, I told my wife, I told my wife, I was like, I need to sleep more. Like, I'm sorry. I, I wish I wish I could help out more, but I, I have to sleep. Like you take morning shift, I'll take night shift, just like we did in the beginning. But I need to sleep a couple more hours because like it was one of those things where like I would be up to like midnight or one o'clock in the morning, and then she would wake me up at eight. I'm like, no, or seven yeah. o'clock. I'm like, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. No, I feel you. Well, now we got our final series of questions, and I think we're going to be cutting this a little tight. I do have another podcast in ten minutes just to kind of anchor this. <laughs> um, so, these require a decent chunk of pretext. Stick with me. All right. So, a lot of people have come on the podcast and they've said that a, the catalyst 
that helps people change from having a fixed mindset, not willing to accept help and not willing to accept change to having a growth mindset, being willing to accept help and being willing to accept change. The (laughs) catalyst that causes this switch is a personal choice that happens after either extreme inspiration or extreme desperation. Do you agree, disagree, anything to add or subtract? It's usually extreme desperation because people are hard-headed and they don't think they think they, they're people still the solopreneurs they struggle down that one path like i'm gonna i'm gonna figure this out myself and i'm not gonna hire anybody to do it and it's usually when your stuff starts breaking breaking around you whether it's processes clients or everything that you do just starts crumbling it's out of desperation that you're like i need help <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> absolutely it is usually desperation real quick because i know I'm going off track. I'm so I anchored the time and then I'm going off track. Anyway, <laughs> if you can think of a business idea or a systematic way to do to force desperation in a moral way into people's lives, I think that would do a lot of good for the world because I think people would make choices to be better. I 100% agree with you. And I think this is the power some salesmen have. So some salesman, so good salesmen can create desperation out of nothing Mm, yeah it it can there's a good and bad side to that because some people use it for bad some people use it for good and i think it's a honed down sales tactic that you grow and learn absolutely absolutely well given the same amount of extreme inspiration or extreme desperation why do you think some people make the choice to change and others don't i think it's ego Mm. ego gets in the way of a lot of people's uh, aspirations and that's what separates the 1% from the 99. It's not that they're rich or have more money. It's that they they chose to live on the edge versus when they didn't. Yeah. So pe- people get too comfortable in the comfort zone and they never leave it their whole life. And then there's people that always live on the edge and that's, that's where they excel. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any tips for helping for people who want to kill their ego, but have been struggling to do it? I think people that have strong egos, they just have to get punched in the face. <laughs> go experience some desperation <laughs> go experience some. De- i mean literally like i i go through this all the time because i talk to business owners all the time and it's one of those things where like their ego is so large they can't listen to anything else so i have to let them fail yeah and it's not that i want them to fail it's just that their ego is so big they can't hear me listening <laughs> they, can, they can't they can't hear anything but the own voice in their head <laughs> uh, yeah No, absolutely. Well, some people need a smaller amount of inspiration or desperation to change and others need a larger, more consistent amount. And I guess that kind of touches on their ego. The size of their ego may determine that. But what do you think establishes the size of our ego, that breaking point for how much inspiration or desperation we need? And can it be influenced? I think a lot of it comes stems from your way you were, the way you grew up. Yeah. Good and good and bad. There's a, there's a saying that uh, weak, weak times create strong men, strong men became strong times create I've, that whole, that whole tier quote. And then it kind of circles back to weak men because they get comfortable. So like me, my dad worked hard. He created a strong man there. My one thing that I have to instill in my kids is that they might have an easier life than I did, but I have to instill them. So there's still have to be work involved, even if it's somebody else's, somebody else's worker. It's one of those things where like, you have to, Make sure you pass that that struggle that you went through. Either force them to go through it, or make sure they understand the lessons that you learned going through it yourself. That way, they don't they don't fall down that trap of being too complacent, where you have that one kid who killed somebody and he said he had affluenza. <laughs> yep. yep. That's that. That's the other end of the spectrum. Is that they were so so silver spooned that they're an asshole. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, awesome. Last question for you. In Atomic Habits, James Clear talks about the four laws of changing your behavior. And before I move forward, I want you to get this person in your mind who has a really fixed mindset, not willing to accept help, not willing to accept change. Get that avatar in your head. The four laws of changing behavior that James Clear talks about are make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, and make it satisfying. With those laws in mind, and the avatar that I just told you to keep in your head, how can we create an environment for the person who has a really fixed mindset, they're not willing to accept help, they're not willing to accept change, that makes it obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying for them to make the choice that will change their life? 
I think this question is really good because I think a lot of people, it drives, it drives that question of like, if you have the ability to do so, do you take that stance? Because it's almost like, it's almost like a God complex because you have the ability to form people down certain paths and it's a good and a bad thing. And I don't, I don't really have an answer for that because for me, I just, I let the, I let them crash and burn because sometimes people need to crash and burn like the forest, the forest is burned down. Oh no, the forest is burned down, but it always creates new life. And that's always a good thing. So sometimes they just need to let it crash and burn. Do you think creating an environment that is accelerating their crashing and burning could be an answer to this question? No, it's a tough edge because if you accelerate people down too fast, they can literally push themselves into depression Mm -hmm. or addiction. And a lot of people can't handle that. So it's based off of their own abilities to handle that stressors. Like a lot of people, they think paying their rent is a stressor, but there's people that have to pay 200 employees bills on the, on Friday. Yep. That's a huge stressor that could cost 200 grand that week. There's different levels of stressors and not everybody can handle it. Gotcha. I like that answer a lot. Well, awesome. Daniel, is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? Man, this, this, is, I, this is a really intellectual conversation. I appreciate the conversation in general. I hope people find a lot of value in that. If you're interested in anything that we do, Hide Mind CRM on Facebook. That's all the only thing I'm going to plug myself in. But yeah, this is a great conversation. Of course. Thanks for jumping on. And if you guys are listening to this and you loved what Daniel had to say, you loved his energy, go ahead and check out Hive Mind CRM. The links will be in the show notes. As we always ask, go ahead and shoot this podcast to one to three people you know need to hear this message. Send us a five-star review on iTunes and we're out. The show is sponsored by The List Guys. Do you need more leads in your local or virtual market? One in 10 small businesses don't invest in any kind of marketing. The List Guys have over 35 plus list types to choose from and you can mix and match any list or criteria. We also use the skip trace list and provide up to seven numbers and email addresses. Every list you purchase will be scrubbed against previous purchases. The List Guys are here to save you time. Contact the List Guys today at www.1listguys.com. That's www.1listguys.com.